No, skepticism is awesome. It's, there you like go. A, <laughs> it's a superpower. It's like you can see the matrix code. All right, now it's 10. There's more people because, you know, been caffeinated. You're out in the world. You're here to see Eugenie Scott. I don't, I don't blame you. She's one of my favorite people. Uh, that means everybody here probably knows who she is. And she is the, what, what is your actual title at the end? I have a cheat sheet. Oh, I have a cheat sheet. I have cheat sheet. Look at that. Executive Director of the National Center for Science Education, Inc. I have to use the ink because you know why not. It's right there on the cheat sheet. And she's going to do a, uh, a fun talk about everything evolves, including creation, creationism, which is an it's odd thing. Well, it's hard. My speech is terrible anymore. I can talk, though. That's what I care about. All right. Thank Eugenie you. Scott. <laughs> Thank you. Well, good morning and thank you for coming. I mean, I realize that this, this is a tough gig. The parade is at 10 o'clock, and all you good people are here to hear me, which is terribly flattering. You could be seeing 94 Darth Vaders, and instead, <laughs> instead, you, you are here. So, but we are, we are, <laughs> exactly. Um, we are here this morning, though, to talk a little bit about what I consider a really interesting controversy, and that's the creationism and evolution controversy. That's kind of my day job at NCSE. Um, many of you know about this article that appeared in Science Magazine a number of years ago. Um, it's uh, the graphic on this uh, article, the little jobby on the lower right-hand side, has been requested very, very frequently by um, the, to the editors of Science Magazine. Um, in this survey of um, attitudes toward evolution internationally, Miller Scott and Okamoto asked the question, humans evolve from earlier forms of life, true or false? And here's that graphic again. <coughs> The blue means accept, the red means no, and the yellow means not sure. We beat Turkey! <laughs> In your face, Turkey. <laughs> <laughs> We're number one from the bottom. Um, uh, now, these data are from 1996, but unfort excuse me, 2006, but they're still valid. Other surveys have pretty much shown the same thing. Um, you might be interested in. Um, here we go. Um, I'm sorry, excuse me, I just realized that one of the slides did not make it. Oh well, never mind. Um, the um, Pew Foundation survey in 2009 is more recent, and uh, it illustrates very nicely, un unfortunately or depressingly, that the attitudes of scientists toward evolution differ considerably from that of the general public. A huge proportion of scientists accept evolution. Um, the general public uh, percentage is considerably lower. Um, this isn't new. Uh, the United States has been behind the curve regarding the acceptance of evolution even as far back as the Scopes case, uh, which I will be spending a little bit of time talking about this morning. And some other things don't seem to have changed much either. Uh, there continues to be opposition to the inclusion of evolution in textbooks. In these old clippings, Florida and California, were only two states uh, around the time of Scopes where evolution in textbooks was protested. And today, publishers still very closely follow what states do when it comes to the um, requirements for uh, teaching evolution and state standards. And I'm sorry to say I wish we had more headlines like this, but <laughs> we do get some. Uh, so let's start at the beginning and considering this creationism and evolution issue with the Scopes trial of 1925. We might very well ask the question, why was there so much opposition to evolution back in 1925? 
A very good book um, by Ronald Numbers, who's uh, quite the historian of the creationism uh, controversy, Darwinism Comes to America, <clears throat> he notes that there was relatively high acceptance of evolution in the educated public at the end of the 19th century, end of the 1800s. And during the early part of the 20th century, most textbooks included the topic of evolution, including this one, which um, uh, John Scopes taught from. Um, part of this was because many 19th century uh, scientists um, uh, were themselves uh, uh, churchgoers, many of them were actually clergymen. And so they uh, represented to the public the idea that yes, you can remain a, uh, a good Christian, but still accept this exciting new scientific idea of evolution. So the, the public attitude toward evolution wasn't as strong, uh, it, it, there wasn't as much anti-evolutionism, shall we say, at the end of the 1800s as there was within the first couple of decades. It grew pretty quickly. And there were a number of factors that influenced this uh, change. Three things. One is the growth of secondary schools. Uh, as American became more urbanized, um, the more, more people moved off the farm, got jobs off the farm. It didn't matter a whole lot if you were a farmer. Uh, you could um, um, have an eighth grade education or a sixth grade education, and then the kids would go back to the farm, and that would be the end of it. In the city, there was more opportunity for education, and there was more need for education. So in the three decades, 1890, 1900, 1910, 1920, the percentage, the, the, the proportion of children going to secondary school, going to high school, practically doubled every decade. What this meant was that more students were exposed to the idea of evolution. And uh, this, of course, did help to trigger a rea reaction against evolution from religiously conservative individuals. And that actually is the second major factor that helps to explain the buildup of anti-evolutionism in the first couple decades of the 20th century. The growth of a specifically American um, Protestant tradition called fundamentalism. Uh, fundamentalism is the name given to a particular strain of Protestant Christianity that grew out of the development of um, 12 small pamphlets called the 12 Fundamentals, which were actually commissioned by some wealthy people in Southern California um, and published, they, they were written by, um, by clergymen and uh, theologians of the time. They were published and distributed widely to uh, Protestant seminaries all over the country and to almost every minister in the country. So the fundamentals had a very broad distribution and they really helped to spur a very, um, a very American kind of, of Christianity, which actually is not typical of Christianity in uh, Great Britain or in Europe. Uh, it's funny because Americans think that biblical literalism is traditional Christianity. It really isn't. It's a fairly recent return to some, you know, pre-medieval ideas. But if you look at the history of Christianity, you know, people like Aquinas were saying uh, uh, centuries ago uh, that, of course, the Bible is not to be interpreted literally. But in the fundamentalist tradition, the Bible was inerrant, and then that fairly quickly uh, shifted over to the idea of, of being literally true as well as, as theologically inerrant. So the rise of fundamentalism increased the proportion of conservative Christians. Um, and of course, biblical literalism is not compatible with the idea of evolution. And so this would naturally increase the number of anti-evolutionists in the first couple decades of the 20th century. But there were other reasons as well. Uh, a major reason was that many socially progressive thinkers associated evolution, particularly evolution through natural selection, with social Darwinism. Sweatshops, child labor, the exploitation of the worker, these were justified by laissez-faire capitalists as being natural. And people like Andrew Carnegie even invoked natural selection as an, uh, a justification for exploitation of workers. Um, he said, and while the law of competition may sometimes be hard for the individual, it is best for the race because it ensures the survival of the fittest. So all you guys in my factory have to work 10 hours a day. Um, you can see why many um, socially progressive people would think that evolution was a very bad idea because of this confusion of the scientific idea of evolution with social Darwinism. 
But in addition to that, there was also World War I. Uh, we don't study World War I enough, I think, these days. Um, the Great War, as it was called, was a truly horrendous slaughter. Uh, a very, very high proportion of uh, young men uh, in Europe and North America um, w went to very unpleasant ends. I I World War I was just uh, an appalling uh, s devastation and carnage. This seemed to many people in the late 19-teens to be a symbol of civilization gone wrong. Now, part of the um, a revulsion uh, against, uh, or that occurred with, with World War I, was specifically directed against the Germans, which before World War I, say in the late uh, uh, 1800s and even the first decade of the 20th century, um, were, were really thought to be the, um, you know, the the, the, a, a great source of learning. You had Wagner, you had uh, German culture, you had German um, uh, in industry and technology. The Germans were considered to be these really quite uh, advanced uh, examples of Western civilization. And then came World War I, and particularly uh, the writings of a man named Vernon Kellogg, who wrote a book called Headquarters Nights that purported to be uh, his accounts of having um, experienced German um, uh, officers during World War I. And uh, he claimed that they based their militarism on evolution, on natural selection. Now this was probably exaggerated, uh, but there, there certainly, it certainly was the case that German militarism was associated by many um, uh, progressives in the United States with the idea of social Darwinism uh, of natural selection and therefore of evolution. So protecting children from learning these ideas was considered a way of protecting civilization. This was a good thing. It wasn't, it wasn't just the idea that um, uh, biblical literalists didn't want their kids taught that the Bible is not literally true. There were a lot of other factors involved in the, um, in the fight against evolution. William Jennings Bryan was one of the leaders of the anti-evolution campaign. And you know, Bryan's gotten something of a bad rap in history. I have a feeling that if Will William Jennings Bryan were alive today, he could get elected in Berkeley tomorrow. I mean, this is a guy who was for women's suffrage. He fought to end child labor. He fought hard for, a decent, for decent working conditions for, for workers. An eight-hour day, who'd have thought it? Uh, the, a lot of ideas that we just considered normal ways of doing business, normal ways of, of being in a, in a civilized society, really were promoted and largely um, uh, passed by this very hard-working uh, progressive uh, Democrat back in the, um, in the, around the turn of the century, the teens and the, and the 20s. Um, he was not as religiously conservative as he is usually presented. He believed in an old earth. He didn't think that the, the earth was 10,000 years old. Um, he did believe that God had specially created Adam and Eve, but he was open to the idea that maybe other animals had evolved. So uh, he wasn't quite the, um, quite the uh, caricature. Uh, of, of fundamentalism that many people think of him. Unfortunately, we tend to confuse Brian with Matthew Harrison Brady, the character in the movie, uh, actually it was originally a Broadway play and subsequent movie, Inherit the Wind. It was a wonderful movie, by the way. Uh, Spencer Tracy, Frederick March uh, appeared in the most famous one, the first one. But the character of um, Matthew Harrison Brady really was not very, uh, it, it did not, very closely resemble um, uh, William Jennings Bryan, who really had a lot more going for him than, than we give him credit. But this movie has come to epitomize the Scopes trial for most Americans, unfortunately. Because really, the, the actual Scopes trial was, as good a play as this is, the actual Scopes trial was much more dramatic and much more exciting. Uh, a very good book by Ed Larson called Summer for the Gods uh, is about the Scopes trial. It won a Pulitzer Prize in history a few years ago, and I recommend you reading it. It's, it's a real page turner. I mean, it's just, this, this trial was so gripping and so exciting, and such wonderful flights of rhetoric. I mean, it really was a wonderful, a wonderful thing. In the movie, um, a, a basic plot is this titanic struggle between Brian and Darrow uh, acting as proxies for modernism and traditionalism. Well, 
that wasn't quite the case. That was part of it, but certainly not all of the Scopes trial. Uh, the Scopes trial is quite an iconic event in American history, certainly. Um, Brian squared off against another fam famous lawyer, Clarence Darrow, uh, pictured there. Brian was a spokesman for fundamentalist Christianity, it's true. Darrow was a free thinker, that's true. But the peop the, Brian and Darrow had a lot more in common than they had in opposition. They had actually been political allies, and Darrow had supported uh, Brian in a couple of his bids for his run for president of the United States uh, years before. Um, as Brian got more religiously conservative, this, this contributed to the rift between them. But they actually, they actually shared far more views than, they, than, than divided them. But the Scopes trial um, was really about the banning of evolution, uh, but also about the rights of workers. The Butler Act was passed by Tennessee Assembly in 1925, and it banned the teaching of human evolution. A small organization in New York, the American Civil Liberties Union, which had just gotten started at around the early 1920s, was concerned with freedom of speech, but also with the rights of workers. And they looked at the Butler Act as an attack on the free speech of teachers, who were, of course, workers. So their real concern was not you know, fundamentalism versus science. It was not science versus religion. It was really the free speech of teachers. That the teachers should be able to teach what they consider to be good science. And the ACLU advertised that it would be willing to, um, you know, to, to defend any teacher in Tennessee who wanted to challenge the law. Now, it happened that the civic leaders of Dayton, Tennessee, decided that this is a great opportunity to put Dayton on the map, as they looked at it, by staging a trial of the Butler Act in their town. A couple of, um, of the civic leaders there thought that uh, the Butler Act was a bad law and should be challenged, but really most of the people in Dayton who were pushing this idea that the trial should take place here um, really, really were looking at it as, as more of a publicity stunt than anything else. Well, okay, so who's going to be the plaintiff? The regular biology teacher was a man close to retirement. He wasn't interested in being a plaintiff. He just wanted to go off and fish. That was what he was more interested in. So the civic leaders were meeting in Robinson's drugstore, and they uh, said, well, what about that young fellow, Scopes? John T. Scopes was a 25-year-old coach uh, who was working at the uh, high school. This was the summertime, actually, uh, late, you know, early, early summer, uh, just after school was out. And uh, they, you know, sent somebody over to the tennis courts to bring Scope over to the drugstore to talk with him about would he, would he be willing to be a plaintiff in this. And first of all, they had to find out if he'd ever actually taught a science class, because after all, he was brought in there to be the coach. Um, well, he had substituted for the biology teacher, uh, and so he had taught a day, and so that was good enough. <laughs> <laughs> There's actually some question as to whether Scopes actually had taught evolution, but you know, that, that's all. This was, this was to bring publicity to Dayton. That was the whole reason why these folks wanted to do it. So uh, he said, yeah, sure, he wasn't doing anything else. He was an amiable young man. And he went back to his tennis game, and the city fathers of, uh, uh, notified the ACLU that they had a plaintiff. Well, although William Jennings Bryan hadn't encouraged the passage of anti-evolution laws like the Butler Act, that really wasn't part of his, his thing. He, he did go around speaking against evolution, but he didn't think you should have laws against it. Uh, when he found that there was going to be a trial, he volunteered to lead the prosecution. He was a little bit of a publicity hound for all of his positive characters, certainly. And the prosecution thought this was great, because here the great commoner was going to be coming in, and boy, that was really going to bring the press. That was really going to, going to fill up the town with, with visitors, and this was really fun. Once Brian was involved, Clarence Darrow, also insisted on being part of the defense team. Um, now, the ACLU leaders were not very happy with this because they already had a crack legal team. They had people like Dudley Field Malone and John Neal, who were certainly Darrow's um, uh, equal in, in their presence and in their ability. And uh, actually, if you, if you read Larson's book, or even better, read the trial transcripts, you find that people like Neil and Malone really had the best speeches. I mean, they, these were brilliant men. And, you know, Darrow was this uh, kind of cantankerous character that um, uh, the 
defense thought was not really going to be adding quite so much as just making a circus out of it. And of course it did turn into a complete circus. The uh, city fathers of, of Dayton got exactly what they wanted. Uh, they got um, you know pretty girls standing in a row holding little monkeys and they got um, people with banners uh, supporting evolution, uh, 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 trying to ban evolution, um, and they got the press. Uh, you know, the Scopes trial is often called the, the trial of the century, um, and of course every trial thereafter was then labeled the trial of the century. So the Simpson trial, O.J. Simpson, that was the trial of the century. Can't hold a candle to Scopes, frankly. As interested as everybody was and as much as the press followed the Simpson case, a much higher proportion of American citizens were glued to their radios listening to the broadcast of the Scopes trial than um, were following the Simpson trial, even with television and everything else. Uh, this was a real media event. The Scopes trial was broadcast live, coast to coast, by this newfangled thing called radio. Um, so this was true modern communication. And of course, newspapers from all over the country also sent reporters. And they followed very closely. They, they would use this new fangled radio device and television, or telephone, I mean, telephones were quite exotic too, after all, to um, uh, file their stories, which would then be published and people would learn about the Scopes trial. So the, the, the trial was a fascinating uh, cultural event, in addition to being very important in the history of our controversy today. Well, during the trial, Williams, William Jennings Bryan made three basic statements. He said that evolution is unsupported science, that scientists were giving up on evolution. It really wasn't a valid scientific idea, so of course it should not be taught. He also said that evolution was incompatible with Christian faith, and therefore it shouldn't be taught, because of course, um, you know, you would not want to turn children away from religion in school. And he also said that citizens, rather than experts like teachers, should decide what the curriculum should be. It wasn't up to John Scopes to decide what to teach. It was up to the people who paid his salary. He who pays the piper calls the tune. And if the citizens of Dayton told, or the citizens of the state of, of Tennessee told John Scopes or any other teacher that he should not teach evolution, then he should just salute briskly and do it because you know citizens should determine the curriculum. Some of you might recall a ringing phrase from the um, um, president of the uh, uh, chairman of the uh, Texas Board of Education uh, a few years ago in reference to the Texas science education statements. Some Texans in the audience chuckling here. Someone's got to stand up to experts. I mean, this, this view is around. This view is definitely around. At NCSC, we have for many years referred to the pillars of creationism. These are the three ideas that modern day creationists seem to use and recycle all the time. So if you pick up a book or a pamphlet or you see a video or movie or something, a letter to the editor, it's very likely that one or more of these three ideas is going to be expressed in it. And, and pretty much everything we've seen from the creationists has been able to be tucked into one or one of these three pillars, so to speak. <clears throat> One is that evolution is a theory in crisis. You know, scientists are giving up on evolution. It's not considered to be as valid as it once was. A second pillar is that evolution and faith are incompatible. You have to choose. Either you're a good guy Christian creationist or you're a bad guy atheist evolutionist. No middle ground. This is a, a, a deep line in the sand that uh, you have to be on one side or the other. This is sounding familiar, of course, isn't it? This is very much what William Jennings Bryan was saying in 1925. And in fact, the third pillar of creationism also is rather similar to what Bryan was talking about way back then. Our third pillar is the fairness pillar. Well, if you teach creationism, sorry, if you teach evolution in the schools, it's only fair that you teach something else to balance it out. Okay, preview of coming attractions. Originally, the idea was teach evolution, but balance it with the teaching of creationism. The courts took, took care of that pretty quickly. Then it was teach evolution, but balance it with the teaching of creation science, which I'll talk about in a moment. Courts knocked that down too. Then it was teach evolution, but balance it with the teaching of intelligent design. Courts took care of that too. And now what we have, and I will explain all of these in a little bit more detail in a moment, teach evolution, but balance it 
with the idea of evidence against evolution. Tell students that evolution is, is really very poor science, the first pillar. Um, so the, the third pillar is kind of an amalgamation of things. And one of the, um, um, uh, one of the interesting um, uh, manifestations of the third pillar that I'll talk about a little bit later on is not just fairness, but also um, critical thinking, something that is near and dear to the hearts of all of us uh, skeptics, that we should get students to think critically about evolution, think about the flaws of evolution, and then weigh them to, to determine you know, whether evolution is valid or not, which, of course, we all know ninth graders are very good at doing. But back to the Scopes trial. Um, the mainstream media, through H.L. Mencken and others, poked fun at the traditional views of the Tennesseans. Uh, Mencken's uh, dispatches were, were <laughs> really very funny um, to uh, modern ears. Um, uh, mean, but funny, nonetheless. I mean, he referred to the Tennesseans as the bourgeoisie, which <laughs> was a little harsh. But, and of course, you know, Europeans um, uh, collectively raised their eyebrows. It's important to remember that Scopes lost, and the Butler Act stayed on the books for 30 more years. Um, more important than the uh, laws remaining on the books, and actually a couple other states passed laws similar to the Butler Act after 1925, but more important than that, textbook authors who feared the loss of sales, since evolution was such a controversial issue, of course, just started quietly removing evolution from their wares. In the book that Scopes taught from, Hunter's Civic Biology, um, evolution was included, and of course that was the case with most books in 1900, 1920, 1925. After the Scopes trial, though, evolution just disappeared. Those chapters were just deleted, just written over. And um, other textbooks followed suit, and evolution quietly disappeared from the curriculum. According to Ed Larson, by about 1930, you would be hard pressed to find much evolution taught in American high schools. And this is pretty much the way it remained until the 1960s. Now, some of us are old enough to remember Sputnik. Sputnik was a Russian satellite that was um, put into space uh, in 1958 and was astonishing to the, to the United States because the Russians had beat us to space. And this was a, you know, th this did not agree with American exceptionalism. Uh, Americans were terribly upset that the Russians had gotten up the first satellite. And um, they actually did something about it as opposed to nowadays. Um, they. <laughs> Congress seems to be a little more functional back then than it is now. But they started pouring money into the National Science Foundation to increase the amount of scientific research, because obviously the Russians were doing it and we weren't. And they also, from our point of view here, for our interest here, they started putting money into science education. And what happened was a series of, of committees of scientists and master teachers were appointed to write new textbooks and to um, develop new curricula for science education because clearly we needed to do something about the pipeline as well as the scientific research because the Russians were up there and we weren't. Um, now, the new textbooks came out within a few years. Uh, by about the early to mid-60s, these books were hitting the um, uh, high school shelves and they became very popular. And so commercial textbook publishers started cloning these books. They included evolution. They included ecology. They included human reproduction. Oh my. They were, the, these new books were really quite, quite the exciting thing. And so uh, the high school curriculum changed considerably in the 60s and 70s. Well, this caused a problem because in the state of Arkansas, there was still one of these anti-evolution laws on the books. And what is the teacher to do? The Arkansas Education Association decided that since the books included evolution, uh, but the law said you couldn't teach evolution, what they needed to do was file a lawsuit that would just be a little housekeeping thing that would get rid of this silly law that nobody was going to pay any attention to anyway. And they asked um, a young 25-year-old high school biology teacher named Susan Epperson to be the plaintiff. Um, she was a native uh, Arkansan. Uh, her father had been a high school biology teacher before her. Uh, she had, um, you know, she was a churchgoer. She was the perfect plaintiff in lots of ways. Plus, 
I mean, you know, the, the Arkansas Education Association figured that this case would just, you know, that this would just be a rubber stamp sort of thing. The judge would say, yeah, this is a silly law, and, you know, fine, and, and Susan would go back to the classroom, no big deal. But just in case something happened and it got complicated, uh, Susan would be leaving the state the next year with her husband, who was in the Air Force, and they were going to be going away to his next station. So she'd sort of be safely out of the way, should anything untoward happen. But they, they re really reassured her that this was just going to be a piece of cake. She wouldn't even have to testify. Well, that's not quite what happened, of course. Um, in the case Epperson versus Arkansas, uh, for reasons that were not at all clear, uh, the local court um, uh, supported the law. And so it was appealed. And eventually, to make a story short, it was appealed all the way to, to the Supreme Court, which, to everybody's surprise, took the case. And the Supreme Court, because the Supreme Court takes very few cases, as you probably know, but um, they took this one for a variety of reasons that, that are, are kind of fun to talk about, but we don't have time to talk about today. But probably Abe Fortas being the Supreme Court justice had a lot to do with it. Um, but the Supreme Court took the case and just came down like a ton of bricks on the anti-evolution law that uh, was extant in Arkansas, which of course was very similar to the Butler Act. Now, let's just take a moment to talk about why the Supreme Court struck down an anti-evolution law. It goes to the First Amendment of the Constitution, which you find in the Bill of Rights. And the First Amendment has a clause about religion. It has two parts to it. Congress shall make no law regarding an establishment of religion or inhibiting, prohibiting the free exercise thereof. The establishment and free exercise clauses are two sides of a coin. It says that the government can't advance religion, nor can it inhibit religion. Looking at these two clauses together, governments have to be neutral toward religion. And what the court held in Epperson versus Arkansas is that the anti-evolution law was unconstitutional because it selects from a body of knowledge a particular segment which it proscribes for the sole reasons it is deemed to conflict with a particular religious doctrine. Therefore, it was unconstitutional and the law had to be struck down. Now, the particular religious doctrine that was being promoted by the um, anti-evolution laws like Arkansas's was a specific Christian view called special creationism. Now, the most common form of special creationism uh, has, obviously, God creating. All cre Christians believe that God created in some fashion or another. But the way God creates is what's significant about special creationism. God creates everything in its present form. Uh, so humans were created as humans, and ducks were created as ducks, and, and uh, bryozoans were created as bryozoans. You can look at bryozoans. Nobody remembers bryozoans. I don't even remember bryozoans. But they're these little varmints. Um, and also that when it comes to bio biology, biological evolution, kinds of organisms are created. So there's a human kind, and a duck kind, and a cat kind, and a dog kind. And it's not that dogs and cats ultimately have a common ancestor. It is that they were specially created kinds with maybe limited genetic variability. The most common form of special creationism has this creation event occurring at one time over the six 24-hour days of Genesis. So it's a, it's a biblical literalist point of view. Now the most important element of this uh, special creationist point of view is the creation of things in their present form. Stuff doesn't evolve. Uh, the whole universe, the galaxies, everything, uh, the planet Earth, the animals and plants on planet Earth, these were all specially created in their present form. Now this view is obviously completely incompatible with evolution. Uh, if you believe that God created things as specially created kinds, evolution isn't going to work for you. This is not something that is possible to be accommodated to your faith. We should you know, contrast this with evolution, which is an idea that really cuts across all of science. Uh, we generally tend to think of biological evolution, but really astronomy is a biological science. Excuse me, as, a, as an evolutionary science, because of course the cosmos evolves, uh, galaxies evolve, uh, solar systems evolve, and so forth. And the planet Earth is a um, an evolving system. So geology is an evolutionary science. Obviously, plants and animals evolve. Biology is an evolutionary science. And human cultures evolve. So anthropology is an evolutionary science as well. The idea of cumulative change over time is at the heart of the big idea of evolution. 
I'm going to talk a little bit about biological evolution because uh, it, it's amazing the misconceptions that even educated people have about evolution. Now you probably know everything there is to know about this subject, but maybe some of these ideas might help you explain to someone else. I'm not assuming that you are being educated here. When most, you know, really, if you were to walk outside and ask the first ten people, what is evolution? What you would hear most frequently is man evolved from monkeys. Okay? <laughs> now, <laughs> The nice thing about that picture, Derek, is that it's a high-resolution picture. That was my only goal, is to find a high-res picture. I will look for another high-res picture of you, because I prefer to show pictures of people that they liked of themselves. I do that for creationists. I certainly can do it for friends. I, I will go and I'll go there. <laughs> Although the chances are I will never use this slide again because I, this, slide, this slide changes every time I use it. Whoever my host is gets the opportunity to appear <laughs> in the film. Well, no, in fact, evolution isn't about man evolved for monkeys. It's really about the idea of common ancestry. What Darwin called descent with modification, which has this wonderful um, uh, 19th century uh, uh, ring to it, and, but, you know, but you know what descent with modification is because you and I have descended with modification from ancestors, and most immediately our, our parents, grandparents, and so forth. So my sister Sue and I are the children of my father. Dad is the child of Grandpa. Grandpa is also the father of Uncle John. Uncle John's the father of Cousin Liz. Okay, so what? Well, there's an interesting relationship here among these people who are genetically related in this hierarchical fashion, if, as it were. Sue and I look more like each other than we look like Liz. The reason for that is that Sue and I share a common ancestor in Dad, more recently than we share a common ancestor with Liz, with Grandpa. But Sue and I and Liz look more like one another than we look like this lady here, um, even though sooner or later we're related to you too, right, and, and Eric. <laughs> Because Sue and I and Liz shared a common ancestor with Grandpa more recently than we shared a common ancestor someplace back in time with you. That's the basic principle of evolution. The more, recently, the more recent the common ancestor, the greater the similarities. And it works really nice with animals and plants as well. So bears and dogs look more like each other than they look like lions. Because bears and dogs shared a common canid-like ancestor caniform ancestor with each other, more recently than they shared a common carnivore animal with the cats. And similarly, Cebus and Howler monkeys look more like each other than they look like apes, because the monkeys shared a monkey-like ancestor with each other more recently than they shared a common primate ancestor with apes. But you know, bears and monkeys look more like each other than they look like salamanders because bears and monkeys shared a common mammal ancestor with each other more recently than they shared a common vertebrate ancestor with the salamanders. The more recently you share a common ancestor, the more similar you are. And it was actually through looking at similarities and differences of anatomy, of embryology, nowadays, of course, uh, post-Darwin, we have biochemistry, molecular biology, we have a lot of comparisons that we can make, looking at similarities and differences of organisms. And we find these same sort of hierarchical groupings of similarities and differences, which we infer represents an evolutionary or a descendant uh, ancestor relationship. It is an inference. It's not an observation. Okay, you know, evolution is not a fact in the sense that it's something that we that we see, uh, except you know maybe very short-term evolution in the laboratory situation. We don't see bears and dogs having a common ancestor. This is an inference. But all powerful scientific ideas are inferences. That's what theories are. Theories are inferences, and theories explain nature. Evolution is a very powerful theory that explains all of these differences and similarities that we see among animals, because they are more distantly or more uh, closely related. Well, back to man evolved from monkeys. Instead of man evolved from monkeys, we'll just take that arrow away. We're, we're actually not that closely related to monkeys. They are not our closest relative. Our closest relative are apes. 
specifically the African apes, probably chimpanzees. And there's a difference between an ape and a monkey. They're not the same thing. Uh, if you ever want to just drive a, an anthropologist into a frenzy, uh, show him a picture of an ape and say, oh, look at the cute monkey. Ah! And we all just freak out. <laughs> you know, we, we all just get twitchy at that point. But what happened is that humans and apes shared a common ancestor. Further back in time, the human ape group shared a common ancestor with monkeys. The more recently you shared a common ancestor, the more similar you are. So we're much more similar to chimpanzees than we are to monkeys. Okay, enough about evolution. But going back to the 1960s, evolution was coming back into textbooks. It's coming back into the curriculum. More high schools are teaching evolution. Just as back in the day uh, before the uh, Scopes trial, more evolution comes into the curriculum, more evolution comes into the school, more kids are being faced with evolution. That's when the creationists get up, get excited, and start fighting back. Uh, there's sort of an interesting sine wave of the when evolution comes into the curriculum, when the creationists start getting active again. Uh, they shut up when we just remove evolution. I don't think that's a good idea. I'd rather continue opposing them than just get rid of evolution and shut them up, because it's important that evolution be taught. So evolution's coming back into the curriculum. Seeing this happen, a creationist came up with uh, a strategy, which I mentioned briefly, which was to try to get the Bible taught along with evolution. Well, that's obviously not going to stand uh, you know, before the Establishment Clause. The court struck that down very, very quickly. It was a very short-lived effort. Well, if you couldn't teach the Bible, maybe you could teach an alternative science. Maybe you could develop something called creation science and have a place in the classroom. You have evolution science on one hand, creation science on another. Henry Morris and his followers developed something called creation science, or scientific creationism, which was a little different from previous creationist uh, uh, efforts, which just were based upon biblical literalism. So is this, but with the added value, if you will, that they believed that it was possible to support through scientific observations and um, theory that um, everything had been created at one time in its present form. That is really the goal of, of creation science. Now. Um, Creation science obviously is biblically literalist, um, and they need to interpret the Bible as requiring Earth to be only thousands of years old, but yet you've got all this geology to explain. So catastrophic geology is really uh, the, the heart of creation science. So all of Earth's geological features have to be the result of catastrophic processes, specifically Noah's flood. It's a really big thing in creation science. And just to give you an example of, of creationist uh, geology, remember Grand Canyon? Grand Canyon is the lower portion of what's referred to as the Colorado Plateau. The Grand Canyon is about 4,000 feet of sediment. But then notice in the grand staircase here on this slide, there is twice that much uh, additional strata that occur outside the Grand Canyon, building up across this very large uh, area in the central part of the state uh, of the United States. All of this has to be explained by catastrophic geology, and so the um, Grand Canyon itself, as well as the other strata above Grand Canyon, have to be explained by either the flood or things that happened after the flood. So in creationist stratigraphy, the bottom part of the canyon is pre-flood, uh, the canyon itself was formed in the early flood, and then the rest of the Colorado Plateau was formed as the floodwaters of Grand Canyon gradually settled on down. How was Grand Canyon cut, you ask? Well, Grand Canyon also had to be cut catastrophically because not only do you have this 4,000 feet of strata, you have to cut a big ditch through it because currently, of course, it's this large hole in the ground. Creation science proponents believe that there was a large body of water greater than six times the volume of Lake Michigan. We're ta talking lots and lots of water that was impounded, uh, much like Glacial Lake Missoula, you know, had an ice dam, was impounded north of Grand Canyon. And where that arrow is, is where it broke through to catastrophically carve Grand Canyon in a period of about a week. <laughs> That's moving right along. <laughs> um, if you want to know why 
Grand Canyon was not laid down by Noah's flood or catastrophically cut. Um, this is a plug for the National Center for Science Education's Grand Canyon trip, which we do every summer, which is an awful lot of fun. Here we are looking at a wonderful slab of Coconino sandstone, which has these wonderful little quadruped, um, probably lizard or, or reptile, uh, footprints running across it. Now, the Coconino said, just as a hint of coming attractions here. The Coconino sandstone is a really interesting feature because it's kind of way up in the canyon and there's all these uh, levels of mudstone and limestone and, and um, sand, uh, uh, other kinds of sandstone. Then there's this big white Coconino layer and then there's a whole bunch of these other sandstone and siltstone and other layers above it. Characteristics of the Coconino indicate to geologists that this was lain by wind. It's aeolian. Now, most of the Grand Canyon has been laid down by water. The, the kinds of limestones and sandstones uh, have characteristics that indicate to geologists that this was water lane, not the Coconino. So the creationists have an interesting thing to explain. How do you get water, 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 wind, water, 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 in one event taking place over about a period of a year, because that's the, the canyon. So we have a lot of fun with the, with the creation science. Now, I love talking about this, but I don't have time since I'm trying to give you a history. But there are many, many resources that you can go to to find out why creation science is not very good science. Um, the best source on the web is talkorigins.org, and I would encourage you to check their resources, our resources at NCSC as well. Now one of the real interesting, if you sort of step back and look at not so much the details of creation science, but sort of their overall gestalt or their overall idea, they have what they call the two-model approach. So you have either special creation or you have evolution. These are the only two possibilities. So clearly, if you just disprove evolution, what's left? Um, they don't feel that it's necessary for them to have positive evidence that everything was produced at one time in its present form 10,000 years, 6,000 years ago. That's not necessary. All they need to do is disprove evolution and creationism wins by default. This is a, this is a tidy uh, kind of approach to things, isn't it? And so when you look at the creationist literature, what it consists of is little attacks on evolution, lots of anomaly mongering and so forth and so on. Things like the Coconino sandstone, it's, you know, they got to come up with some positive explanations for that because that, that definitely refutes their particular views. But most of their literature is attacking evolution. We're going to come back to this idea in a little bit. Well, in the um, 19, uh, why have you not moved? There we go. Pardon me? Oh, sorry. Thank you very much. Um, uh, there, there's many reasons why special creationism is not the only option. <laughs> I'd forgotten that. There's a few more things on this slide than I'd forgotten. I, it's not the fault of the little computer. Um, there, there are lots of logical problems with this, if not evolution, then creation, mostly because there's many more options over there on the creationism side. So it is simply just not logical that disproving evolution proves special creationism. It doesn't prove special creationism any more than it proves uh, theistic evolution or proves the uh, Hopi view or the ancient Maya or anybody else. But going back to the 1970s and 80s, there were many efforts to try to get creation science um, required by law to be taught. Many state legislatures uh, had legislation submitted that would require that if you taught evolution, you had to teach creation science alongside of it. And obviously scientists and teachers opposed this very strongly. This actually was the beginning of NCSE. Um, our, my organization got started as a way of opposing these kinds of, of uh, views. Arkansas passed such a law and Louisiana passed such a law. Uh, to make a long story short, a uh, fascinating story, um, the Arkansas and Louisiana laws were both challenged. The Louisiana law ended up going all the way to the Supreme Court. And in a case called Edwards versus Aguilard, the Supreme Court struck down the uh, equal time for creation science laws. There was, however, a um, consequence of the uh, decision in Edwards versus Aguilard that was written by Justice Brennan. Justice Brennan wrote that um, that teachers certainly were uh, able to teach scientific alternatives to evolution. Of course there aren't any, but if there were any then teachers could teach them. Of course 
creation science was the original scientific alternative to evolution, wasn't it? Justice Scalia said that teachers have the right to teach the evidence against evolution. We'll come back to these. Now, one of these scientific um, alternatives to evolution actually was already bubbling along, so to speak. The, um, uh, during the time the Edwards case was working its way through the courts, the, uh, a group of conservative Christians were concerned that creation science was not going to be legally viable, so they tried to derive a more legally viable form of creationism that could be countered with evolution. The book on top here, The Mystery of Life's Origin, is considered to be, the by many um, of these folks to be considered the first intelligent design um, presentation to use these terms as intelligent design people use them today. Now the mystery of life's origin by Thaxton, Bradley and Olson, Thaxton by the way retired to Peachtree uh, a few years ago, uh, dealt with the origin of life which they believed is not just a difficult scientific problem, everyone agrees it's a difficult scientific problem, but the origin of life, they said, was a problem that was outside of science to answer. Because, the, because life is so complicated, there could not possibly be a natural explanation. The only possibility for explaining the first um, cell was supernatural creation. They didn't use those terms, of course. They talked about the requirement for an intelligent design. And um, this, of course, is an idea that's been around for a while. Uh, this was actually William Paley's original idea, the, the watchmaker idea, that um, um, if you are on a heath and you see a watch, uh, excuse me, you see a stone, you wouldn't think two things about it. The stone might have been there forever. If you see a watch, you know because of the complexity of the watch, because of all the parts of a watch working together to tell time, you know, springs and wires and all these things, you know that there had to be a watchmaker as opposed to the stone, which was a totally natural thing and you wouldn't think twice about it. Therefore, said Paley, when you saw something like the vertebrate eye, which like a watch was sort of like an artifact, it had all these parts that worked together, a purposeful ordering of parts, if you will, uh, to bring light into the eye. You know there had to be an eye maker. What William Paley was doing in his book Natural Theology is offering an apologetic proof of the existence of God. Just like there had to be a watchmaker, because watches are so complex, they couldn't naturally come together, so of course there had to be a, an eye maker. There had to be a God. Well, of course, that was the big contribution of Darwin. He came up with a natural way of getting complicated things like eyes. And this, of course, was why um, evolution was, natural selection was very uh, controversial. But intelligent design basically is the same old Paleon idea, that there are things that are just so complicated um, that they cannot have a natural explanation, natural selection can't do the job, therefore there must be an intelligence behind them. And of course, we all know who and what the intelligence is. Michael Behe's Darwin Black Box presented the idea of irreducible complexity. Um, uh, Bill Dembski's book, The Design Inference, presented the idea of uh, specified complexity. Both of these are the same kind of thing. It's the idea that either complicated things are so improbable in Dembski's terms that they would require supernatural intervention to produce, or that they are just so complicated, like Paley's eye, um, which is this um, irreducible complexity idea with a few wiggles, that they would require something supernatural to produce. Um, both of these ideas have been pretty thoroughly rejected by the scientific community. Schematically, the intelligent design proponents claimed that specified complexity or irreducible complexity couldn't be produced by chance, by natural selection, um, therefore it had to be presented, uh, produced by intelligent design. Well, obviously everyone agrees that chance can't produce something like an eye. Um, the intelligent design people say that uh, natural selection, no, no other natural process can produce um, something like an eye, a highly specified thing, so therefore they win. Um, now, most scientists would say, well, not so fast. We're, we, we have very good reason to believe that natural selection can produce very complicated things like eyes, so we don't really believe that. But just for the sake of argument, there's a real problem with this kind of logic, right? Because, okay, how many of you think that all scientific discoveries have been discovered? Clearly, nobody who's got any knowledge of science is going to raise their hands. What about unknown causes that might explain something like irreducible complexity? If we were convinced that natural selection couldn't do the job, 
if natural selection couldn't produce complicated structures. For some reason, you know, we were convinced of this. The proper explanation is we don't know yet. The proper explanation is not, oh, supernatural intervention. If, if you're willing, you know, you're welcome to believe that, but you have to realize that you have stepped outside of science if you are taking that perspective. You cannot call yourself a scientist and hold that position. You know, this all sounds very familiar. You know, the old two-model approach where you disprove evolution, you prove special creation. This is not very different from the intelligent design position. If natural selection can't do the job, then intelligent design does. It's very similar to that old position. In my view, creation science is the bigger set, but really intelligent design is nested very nicely within it. There's really no argument that the intelligent design people have produced that is not already extant in creation science. Although the intelligent design people don't talk about Noah's flood and Adam and Eve and a lot of the biblical literalist stuff, it still is the same old, same old. Now again, I don't have time, alas, to go into uh, why intelligent design is wrong. Um, I think it's very interesting that many um, religious um, moderates uh, don't think intelligent design is uh, very helpful either. And uh, there's a lot of theologians in mainstream Christianity that have very strongly criticized intelligent design and creation science. Um, and some of these are evangelicals as well which I think is something that is not as well known as it needs to be. Many evangelical Christians also reject creation science and intelligent design. And you'll find some discussion of this on the BioLogos Forum and at the site of the American Scientific Affiliation. So whether intelligent design? Well, in 2004, the citizens of Dover passed a resolution, sorry, the school board in Dover passed a resolution that intelligent design must be taught. Um, the parents in the community sued. There was an extensive trial, and the judge ruled that intelligent design was not science. It was a form of creationism. Creationism is religion, therefore the Establishment Clause was violated, and the practice must be stopped. And we have not heard very many efforts since then to try to get intelligent design um, uh, taught de jour, as it were, taught through policies in public schools. But let's go back to Edwards versus Aguilard, uh, the idea of scientific alternatives, uh, but also Scalia's dissent in Edwards in which he talked about teachers have the right to teach the evidence against evolution. Now, I'll go back, going back to the pillars of creationism, this of course reflects the first pillar that evolution is a theory in crisis, but it also reflects the fairness pillar. The current evidence against evolution strategy really is a way of saying, excuse me, that um, uh, evolution is crappy science and really we ought to have either fairness or critical thinking to have students evaluate it. The argument that's usually given for this is that there are, there, there's this raft of scientists that, that, that anti-evolutionism, the first pillar, uh, there's a lot of scientists who are opposing evolution. And of course, lawyers have a somewhat cynical statement about this. Uh, for every PhD, there's an equal and opposite PhD. Well, that's not really the case. Um, it, it, this is very frustrating to deal with this because this is a meme that seems to have taken root in the culture. That um, because you have scientist A and scientist B, therefore it must be an equal fight. It's not an equal fight. When you look at the number of scientists over here on the evolution side of things, people who are believers and non-believers, that's irrelevant. The fact of the matter is that the scientific community is extremely well united uh, over the idea that evolution has happened. There has been cumulative change in the universe. The percentage of scientists who question evolution is minuscule. This is why we did Project Steve, if you're familiar with Project Steve. But, um, so for every PhD, there is not an equal and opposite PhD at all. But this idea is out there, that there's this strong upwelling of opposition to evolution in the scientific community. Therefore, students should be taught to critically analyze evolution. Uh, students should be taught that evolution, that, that the evidence against evolution should be taught. It's packaged very cleverly as um, as a free speech or freedom of thought kind of thing. Here you have the teacher saying, let me teach. Why can't I supplement my science class with current articles and balanced discussion? Linguistic note. If you're ever reading anything talking about the teaching of evolution, 
And the word balance is used, it's probably written by a creationist. Okay. Or somebody who's read too much of their literature, one of the two. Uh, but the word, you know, balance should make your, your ears prick forward because there's usually something going on here. We, we don't balance the study of gravitation with the study of the theory that the Earth sucks. You know, I mean, we, we just pretty much take, you know, we, we pretty much take what scientists say about gravitation, right? And we should, at the K-12 level, pretty much take what scientists say when they say that living things have common ancestors. And here's the student. Let me think. Why can't I be allowed to decide for myself what the truth is? <laughs> Well, you know, we want you to be a critical thinker, Susie. Um, we want you to be a critical thinker. We really do. But you know, you probably don't know that much about population genetics to really weigh the evidence for evolution in seventh grade. Okay. So the, the idea here is that at the high school level, it's a little different from the college level. We actually don't do that much um, having students evaluate basic ideas of science at the K-12 level. This is just a silly way of doing it. We have, unfortunately, had an awful lot of laws being submitted over the last several years promoting what are called academic freedom bills. Um, the vast majority of these bills have been defeated in committee. If they get to the floor, they're a lot harder to defeat. By the way, when I say these bills have been defeated, it's not just through luck. It's because people like you and people like the ones we deal, we work with, go to their, you know, call up their state representative or they go to those committee hearings and they say, we, we think this bill is going to be bad for our kids' education. We want you to vote against it. It's called politics and it's how we make this country run. So go thou forth and do likewise. But the Academic Freedom Acts are very tricky. Uh, they're going to be harder to deal with from a legal standpoint because they avoid religion completely. They really avoid any kind of reference to religion. This is just about critical thinking. Don't you want your children to be critical thinkers? Um, it's only when you look at the history that you see that this is really about the Establishment Clause. They stress academic freedom. Raise your hand if you're against academic freedom. This is also something that is very popular. So the, the framing of these bills is very good. Many of the bills are protective. They say uh, a teacher may teach the evidence against evolution, as opposed to the Dover policy that said teachers have to teach intelligent design. And a permissive bill is much more difficult to challenge. Uh, you can't get an injunction, usually, against a permissive bill. You have to actually go out there, find the teacher who's teaching creationism, find a student with standing in the class to sue, and it's a much, much tougher situation to stop from a legal standpoint, which, of course, is why they make these bills permissive rather than directive. Um, they're, um, uh, they're, I'm sorry, I was talking about that already. They are protective bills in the sense that they um, protect a teacher who chooses to teach the evidence against evolution, who to chooses to teach alternative views. Alternative views mean creationism. Uh, and the, the bills may or may not stand up in court depending on what the teacher is teaching. So the protective nature and the permissive nature of the bills are very important to this. So in summary, if you will, um, the history of the uh, creationism and evolution issue has been, quite frankly, the evolution of these views in response to a changing legal environment. It's a great example of natural selection. Creation science gave rise to intelligent design. Intelligent design, after Edwards versus Aguillard, gave ri rise to two strains, shall we say. One strain promoting the evidence against evolution, the other strain promoting the alternative theories to evolution. Well, of course, alternative theories you know, if you ask a scientist what's an alternative theory to evolution, we scratch our heads. We don't know what you're talking about. If you ask a proponent of these bills, what's an example of an alternative theory of evolution? <laughs> it sounds very familiar, even if they don't call it intelligent design or they don't call it creation science. Similarly, if you ask um, an example, you know, if, you, if a teacher goes to a scientist and says, I need to teach the evidence against evolution, can I have the list? The scientist does not have a list of evidence against evolution to give there because this is nonsense. All the evidence we have supports the inference of common ancestry. If you ask the proponents of these bills, 
Yeah. Where will I find the evidence against evolution? Well, lo and behold, you find it in the creation science and intelligent design literature. Well, there's lots more to talk about, but I'm sorry to say I've already gone past my deadline. If you go to ncsc.com, you can find more information about this. If you go to this little button here, this is our Friday free, uh, free um, electronic newsletter that Glenn Branch writes. Very, very good. Uh, I would recommend it. If you go to this button, you can go to our news page. The news page allows you to sort by either year or state, find out what's going on around the country, around the world, and it's full of depressing information. Um, <laughs> We are a membership organization. Do consider joining. Oh, and, and we have a table around the corner. Go and see uh, me and Josh uh, Rosenau. We'd be happy to talk with you more about this. We are on YouTube. We are on Facebook. Uh, please do uh, check the NCSC page on Facebook. And if you don't mind my saying so, uh, please don't try to friend me at my Facebook page because I have too many friends. And so I started this page, Eugenie.Scott. Um, please go there if you want to be my, my, my Facebook friend. Uh, you will save me writing you saying, you know, thank you very much for asking to be my Facebook friend, but I can't accept you on this page. Please go here. And that saves me a lot of time. Uh, but I'm, I'm happy. This is where I update, and if you're interested for some reason in my updates, that's where it is. NCSC.com. That's us. Um, Glenn Branch. Uh, is our my deputy director? He writes that wonderful e newsletter. Uh, Robert Lunn is our communications director. Peter Hess is our faith community outreach. Um, Eric Mickel is our education uh, community outreach. And uh, Josh Rosenau and Steve Newton are our flare ups wranglers. Josh is with me today. Go say hello and thank him for all the work he did in Texas this spring, for example. And thank you, and I apologize for going over. Thanks so much for coming. <laughs>